And we're on. Today's Hello. guest, we have Chris Denby White, Chief Security Officer at Next DLP, a leading provider of insider risk and data protection solutions. Today, we're going to be talking and discussing about the organizational shift from reactive ransomware detection to proactive prevention. Chris, welcome on the show, my man. Thank you, Joseph. Great to be here and uh, a super interesting topic to talk about, especially Absolutely. with there being so much ransomware about these days. Yeah, yeah. So fellow Brit, so uh, whereabouts are you in the world at the moment? At the moment, I'm out in deepest, darkest Kent, but I originally <laughs> hail from Yorkshire, as you can tell right. from my very broad accent. Yeah, nice. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Yeah, yeah. So I'm originally from Kent as well. I think I might mention that on our intake, but uh, now I live in sunny Bournemouth on the south coast. Um, but Chris, thanks for coming on. Let's dive straight in. With all my guests, I like to take it right back to where it all began and sort of how you got into the industry. Yeah, I got in through a... A really odd route. Um, I worked for the Met Police in, in a, in a counterterrorism intelligence fun function. I've always been a massive geek, played with my Spectrum as a child and my Zerdex 81. Thoroughly interesting. And it was uh, through working in intelligence in the police that they found themselves in need of an IT person. And it was, Chris, you know computers, can you do our IT now? Um, I said, yes, of course, but you need to actually certify the knowledge that I have. So got some training courses and iterated from there, building uh, infrastructures and repairing infrastructures, but building them in the correct way. And back then, it wasn't necessarily called cybersecurity, it was called responsible admin, and built uh, infrastructures and iterated and did that over and over again for a while inside of inside of the Met Police, inside of the uh, kind of intelligence community there, and then broke out into the outside world doing various roles. Um, Worked for Transport for London briefly, uh, Deutsche Bank in the CISO's office there, and a certain bit of consultancy. And now found myself working for a uh, cybersecurity software company as a CISO, yeah. which is uh, an interesting part. Lovely trajectory. So you was with the police for quite some time, wasn't you? It was over 10 years. Yes, yes, that's right. Uh, a long old time working uh, kind of both kind of intelligence analysis on the CT side, but also at the same time and 100% towards the end, creating, building and securing the platforms that the intelligence officers would be using to do things like OSINT and intelligence analysis as well. So really interesting work in that respect. Yeah, a lot of folks that end up getting into the whole uh, private sector of security, we do find come out of law enforcement or military. How was that transition for you? Because I know it's quite a a unique experience spending so long in an enforcement agency and then going into private sector? Absolutely. It, it's really difficult. And I have people reach out to me quite regularly who are either currently in government service with various different aspects going, well, how do I bridge that gap? And it's, and it's actually quite hard. And I don't think there are two stories that are the same, really. But on a cultural level, it's really odd moving from um, a largely disciplined service like the police or certain intelligence functions into a corporate environment there certainly is a culture shift in the way in which things happen you know uh management structures tend to be slightly flatter you know obviously there are some kind of other companies you know some of the financial services companies i've worked with have had quite regimented management structures but very very different to working inside somewhere that had ranks for example so uh you know that's a bit of a culture shift but I think advice I always give to people, especially people in law enforcement, I think there's a lot of institutionalization there where people don't necessarily recognize the skills that they have. And I think in cybersecurity leadership, some of the things that are lacking, technical skills can be taught. However, soft skills of interpersonal relationships, influencing, um, strategic planning, crisis management are things that the police and other kind of um, government entities teach really well. And these people use these skills on a daily basis, but don't necessarily know the name for them. So I think it's almost educating people that they do have things to offer outside of the service and being able to explain those in a way that businesses and recruiters understand the value of those, if you see what I mean. Absolutely. My, my advice as well would be absolutely to reach out to, to recruiters like myself because there, there is big opportunity for, for folks in yeah. law enforcement in the private sector. Um, so please do reach out if you're listening to this and uh, are in any of the military or uh, enforcement agencies. Um, so, Chris, you then obviously had a couple of other uh, TfL and Deutsche Bank. What was you doing at Deutsche? Because I've done a lot of work with Deutsche in the past. Um, what was you up to there? 
So anyway, I was working in the office of the CISO and I yeah. ran the Global Privileged Access Operations team. So that's, right. uh, that's a very big mouthful there. So basically what that was is Deutsche Bank and not many people outside of the financial services industry know this, there's five separate companies. You, know, you have a private bank, a commercial bank, an investment bank, all these things need to buy virtue of the fact that you know one side is investing, the other side is actually doing the trades, need to be separate. So they operate as separate companies. And then there's a horizontal function across, which is the office of the CISO, that implement the things like compliance controls, and in our case, cybersecurity controls, and in my specific team's case, privileged access. So, you know, multiple thousands of admin users exist across the world inside of Deutsche Bank, and if they're accessing sensitive systems with privileged access, that access needs to be um, just in time access recorded and available for review. So I, on one hand, ran and deployed the teams that did the reviews of those um, of those sessions. And on the other side, I justified the controls that we put in place to people like internal group audit, the financial people that would look into it, kind of the regulators, people like um, the ECB, the Monetary Authority of Singapore, the Federal Reserve Bank. So it was half a revolving door of audit conversations and the other half of ensuring that my teams were able, staffed and motivated to do the job of ensuring that admins were remaining within the guardrails of their role. So super interesting. Yeah, absolutely. And what a, what a powerhouse of an FS uh, financial services business to work in. And just going back to that law enforcement thing, it, 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 you're a, a prime example of how it can be done. I think for some people, it can be quite daunting to think I'm working at the Met Police now and I've got no shot at Deutsche Bank's, Morgan Stanley's, all those sort of firms, but it absolutely is possible. So uh, you're living proof of that. Um, so after Deutsche Bank, you then uh, you then landed yourself uh, at Next. So talk to me a little bit more about, about you guys and what you're up to at the minute there. Absolutely. Next is a really interesting company because for me, there's a bit of a tension there because I'm a chief security officer and I deal in information security in securing our internal business. Yeah. However, a lot of people misinterpret what I do for the company as a marketing CISO, which I'm very much not. Admittedly, I'm appearing on a podcast right now talking about my company, <laughs> yes. Um, however, my day job is ensuring that as a company, we do the right thing. And there's always a tension there. But I decided to join a software company because I looked at what they did. And I looked at the experience that I had working in other companies and the problems that we were trying to solve. And Next is doing something quite interesting in that it's taking data loss and insider threat and it's going, okay, so there are products that exist that we all kind of sigh when we think about try, trying to use and or either as a CISO trying to implement them through security teams or as an end user being blocked by these things. In Deutsche Bank, I was constantly being blocked by the, mm. the, the LP tool. Super aggressive, super secure, which is great, but not great for business friction. So what they've done is, they, from the ground up, built a visibility platform and a control platform to, on one hand, give the security people visibility to answer the simple question, what does normal look like in my organization in relation to data flows? Am I comfortable with that? And what do I need to do about that? And on the flip side with the users, giving them guardrails so they're not inadvertently leaking data or doing the wrong thing and empowering them to make good decisions in relation to how they access, manipulate, transmit data and real-time prompts of education nudges, if you will, to push them off the path of non-compliance onto a path of compliance. And it kind of kind of just works. And I thought, well, actually, yeah, this is actually a really great company. I can see that there's a future here. And also their security program was pretty good when I came into the role. And as a security company, you know, you have to ensure that your security is second to none as well because there's nothing more mm. embarrassing than a security vendor being breached you know that you know almost you know that's something i wouldn't want to happen yeah yeah well if we want to talk about security vendors being breached there's been some pretty big ones in in the news recently but we won't know we no, won't go absolutely into that. and you know <laughs> nobody knows what happens behind closed doors as well and it's all about reducing the possibility of things which i think actually speaks to our topic around you know the difference mm. in um the approach to things like ransomware but uh, yeah we'll get to that absolutely sure. in terms of ransomware just for the audience who might not know specifically a definition or what it is can you in your own words describe what you think ransomware is uh, absolutely well i'll describe what ransomware was and now i'll describe what ransomware is now because there's been a certain distinct change so a ransomware originally was a 
malicious program that executed inside an environment. And what it did was, is it crawled across as much of the data, or in some cases, entire hard, hard disks, and made them inaccessible to the business that owned them by encrypting them. Um, and what would happen then was that the deployer of this ransomware would reach out to the company and say, hi, I've removed all your access to all of your critical data, or indeed all your computers. Um, give me X amount of money, and I'll give you the key to unlock all this data, and you can continue on your merry way doing this business. You know, And we all know that post-incident response isn't as simple as continuing on your merry way. There's massive expense and post-incident investigation that needs to take place. So that's how it used to be. It used to be a single stage attack. Then more recently, um, the ransomware gangs have um, kind of evolved slightly because people mitigated that by having backup. So they go, oh, yeah, today's data is all encrypted, but yesterday's isn't. Therefore, we're not going to pay you. We're just going to restore some backup. Fantastic. So what ransomware gangs have now done more recently is they've gone in, they've encrypted all the data, but they've also copied it as well. So they've said on one hand, hey, if you want access to your data, give us the money. But additionally, if you don't want us to release all your data to everyone else in the world, give us the money. Two-pronged attack. Mm -hmm. So that's what's happening these days. But it's moved on further than that in the last few months as well, quite interestingly. Um, there's now a three and a four-pronged attack. The three-pronged attack is we'll encrypt your data, we'll steal your data, and we'll also tell your customers that we've compromised you if you don't pay. pay. So that's a three-pronged attack. Four-pronged attack most recently happened just before Christmas, and it was, we've encrypted your data, we've stolen your data, we've told your customers, and we've also reported you to the SEC in the United <laughs> States. Yeah. So that's a really interesting move, that actual criminal gangs are filing breach reports to the SEC, telling on the companies that they've compromised because yeah. they haven't paid the ransom, which, you know, there's clearly some thinking behind the business model of these ransomware gangs. So... Uh, yeah, it's um, yeah. it's a growing industry. When you talk about the business model of ransomware gangs, like do you, do you, I don't know if you're tracking them, but are they like individual folks just behind a keyboard, or is it state stuff, state sponsored type stuff? It's a little bit of both. Um, you know, originally, again, these old ransomware gangs we're talking a few years ago were the people that wrote the ransomware malware are generally the ones that deployed it, or very 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 closely linked. But as with all software, both commercial software, like the stuff that we sell, and also malicious software, they decided to go software as a service. Mm. So now what you see is you have a ransomware gang who will say, okay, so you can buy use of our ransomware platform for whatever terms you'd like to use. Um, a few years ago, they had some rules in place, you know, don't attack hospitals or anything to do with children yeah. and stuff, or don't attack Russia, Russia. Those rules are largely blurred now. You don't really see the, those things are still being ransomware. So rather than have to have the knowledge yourself, you can purchase this service, point it at whoever you would like the ransomware or earn some money from, and then the people who run this platform will take a cut and you get your cut. And so we're seeing a more commoditized approach, which could be a reason why we're seeing more of these ransomware attacks taking place, because mm -hmm. it's becoming easier and, you know, like with commercial legitimate legal software, the bar to entry is um, significantly lower now. Yeah. What are some of the factors driving like the increase in the ransomware attacks? Obviously, we had some recent ones with uh, MGM and Caesars and what are I think there is, you know, there's obviously kind of an argument could be made. There's a geopolitical <laughs> context in relation to that. And I think that you run the risk of falling down a rabbit hole of trying to add attribute specific attacks to specific groups and specific motives. So I think, to be honest, the increase in ransomware attacks taking place is down to the fact that they have been largely successful. You know, like any business, if you identify a market where you are able to earn money, then you will try and penetrate that market to the point of it becoming saturated. And mm -hmm. I think it's the, the same as the case for things like ransomware and for cybercrime as well. You know, um, it's easy, it's quick, and it can be done on mass. Uh, whereas kind of individual, you know, targeted, uh, very complex attacks on infrastructures generally is really labor intensive. And, you know, I don't think it necessarily makes financial sense for those yeah. people looking to earn money. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. You've obviously got the argument of do you pay the ransomware? Do we not pay? Like, how long do we leave it until we pay? Or 
Hmm. What, what's your take on it? Because I know it's quite a, it's a back and forth argument. I see lots of discussion on LinkedIn, but. My take on it is that it's a very easy thing to discuss when you're not in the position of <laughs> having your business yeah. leaders and your C suite. And I think, first and foremost, it isn't a cyber security decision and it isn't a CISO decision to make. The CISO decision to have an opinion on and to contribute to the decision around risk, but it's a business decision. You know, it's easy from the outside to say, by paying a ransom, you are funding further ransomware attacks and perpetuating the problem of ransomware around the globe. You know, that's an easy argument to make, but it's not necessarily the most practical argument to make because if your choice is stopping some other ransomware happening to some other person in the future, potentially, or going out of business and your 200, 300 person company all losing their jobs and not being able to feed their families, you know, two extreme arguments. I think it's a very nuanced and complicated argument. Uh, really and yeah. i think again there's the argument about oh is actually funding crime illegal in and of itself and other corporations taking an illegal action again i'll probably give the cissp answer there and say yeah let's talk to legal about that yeah um, because i'm not a lawyer it's, yeah i can't give you a straight answer but it's but it's a very very complicated question as to whether you do or whether you don't and i don't think there's a, a a hard line in all circumstances you must and all circumstances you shouldn't yeah because i do wonder about the whole regulation part of it because obviously with, with the set rulings and whether because you've got like a certain amount of time before you then report it and then i do wonder whether the sec will say if there's like you have to pay or not pay it's, it's gonna it'll be interesting to see how um how it all evolves have you seen much from the sec uh, rulings yeah i don't think necessarily sec rulings is going to be necessarily about that i think that is more around giving investors the right information at the right time rather than mandating a certain response um i don't think that would personally be in their remit and i think reporting of cyber security reporting of um how do they put it i forget the specific term reporting of kind of significant cyber security incident to the SEC, I think is important uh, because if you have any kind of event that will fundamentally affect your share price, then obviously your investors and the SEC kind of need to know about that. So I can understand the thinking around that. But the other ruling at the same time that came out as a reporting one is the in the yearly filings, uh, proving to the SEC that your cybersecurity and information security program has board level buy-in and there is enough knowledge at the board level to be able to understand the information being reported to it and i think that is actually a stronger piece of ruling uh, in relation to improving information security than the reporting one is personally yeah what about um in terms of actually just back onto ransomware how or how, what are some of the like prevention methods that people can put into place to sort of prevent ransomware attacks from happening i, I sort of say it's impossible but what, what, Absolutely. Like, what can uh, they do today? Like, what can organisations do? I think it's not big and it's not sexy, and it's the same as everything else. And something I bang about all the time is do the basics. I think there's a tendency in our industry to chase after state-sponsored APT detection and response capabilities, that kind of a blinky box that solves all the problems. But actually, when we talk about ransomware spreading and we talk about ransomware infections, simple things like patch hygiene. You know, if a critical patch comes out or patching your infrastructure and keeping on top of your patching, understanding what infrastructure you actually have, asset management, application management, and network security as well. You know, in a Windows environment, for example, ransomware spreads using SMB usually, which is the shared protocol to share between systems. That can be locked down and that can be configured in a secure way but more often than not it isn't or there's network segmentation that's not in place and these are simple quite boring quite arduous fixes that harden an infrastructure to say okay so my laptop gets infected with ransomware that's really bad i might lose the data on a laptop but it doesn't mean that my laptop then goes on to infect the file server the domain controller and everybody else's laptops and it's all about configuring things in a secure way and following things like the CIS uh, top 10 around and the CIS benchmarks about how do I implement this properly as opposed to implement this quickly so it just works, which is, you know, I'm an old IT admin previously as well. And, you know, I 
occasionally in the past been guilty of this needs to be up and this needs to be working so i'll do the thing that makes it work but people need to then go back and understand what is least privilege in relation to system accounts and network topography and things like this and do that work in architecting secure defensible system and that's how you prevent well that's how you reduce the risk of and reduce the impact of ransomware um just my personal thing in terms of getting buy-in from organizations to actually do those basics like you say like how how can they do that easily or is there an easy way of doing it because sometimes you feel like you might be banging your head against the door um yeah talk to me is there a way that we can sort of make it easy i think again doing things in a meaningful and plans and codified way is really important. And you have a bunch of frameworks out there. You know, things like ISO 27001, you've got kind of corresponding things like um, Foxy Type 2 in the state. You have even things like kind of the CIS benchmarks and stuff. And I think in codifying this into, this is a program of things I want to do, and this will be the improvement and the impact based on that, rather than individual point things i think again there's a tendency for us especially in kind of companies that are audit driven they have an audit finding on one specific thing so they expend all their effort fixing that one specific thing rather than identifying root cause yeah. so i think in doing this is have a plan understand how much it will cost and give people an end date when this will be done in the wider business and then show what the actual result of this change will be you know for example when we talk about cyber insurance um cyber insurance companies will generally give people a big questionnaire of like have you done this 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 and this um basically mapping that back to the business and say look if we did a few of these things which are also on my list as well our cyber insurance premiums are going to be significantly lower and, and or we may get cyber insurance you know mm. many cyber insurers if you can't say that you patched within you know a very very short amount of time critical vulnerability abilities won't even touch you for insurance now mm. um so i think it's showing that knock-on effect i think information security and cyber security is moving from being an it discipline now to being a business discipline and i think these folks need in a lot of ways to catch up and tailor their communication to be business communication drivers which is the is answering the questions you know how much money is this going to make as a company how much money is this potentially going to lose as a company and how do we ensure that none of the people in this room are held accountable for anything that goes wrong? Um, yeah. You know, those are the three things that generally C suite concern themselves with. And I think cybersecurity improvement programs can answer all three of those questions. Nice. How specifically are Next helping organizations? We're helping them a lot, actually, because a lot of companies struggle with understanding what normal looks like. Um, across their infrastructure or their, for example, in data loss, you know, the classic data loss prevention project involves um, scanning all the file storage, scanning all the files, and then getting a big list of like 500,000 documents that potentially might be sensitive. Whereas uh, we're going in and we're basically implementing a very simple deployment of an agent. We had a customer that deployed over 10,000 agents in four hours. And I think two of those hours was the change control meeting. Um, it, it, again, this one of the reasons I joined the company, ultra simple. And from that moment of installation, you can understand everything that's happening on that endpoint with the data and have that control. Um, add to that kind of the inclusion of things like um, an AI co-pilot. So you have all this information coming in, these guardrails around users, but helping the security operator to be like, okay, so what does this mean? And then what are the next actions I need to do? These are some of the things that we can do for customers. Yeah. To give them quick, being able to grasp the reins back of control of their data and, and be able to then understand what's happening, identify shadow business processes. Sometimes security don't even know that businesses are doing things in a certain way. And that's a perfectly fine thing for the business to do, but it needs to be risk assessed. So, it's all those things based around visibility, control, and engagement with the wider biz business is kind of our core mantras in what we deliver for customers. Yeah, nice. You mentioned customers who who are um, like the the ideal customers for you. Is it sort of a big enterprise play, SMB, mid market? I think to be honest, um, we kind of play in kind of 
the mid-market uh, kind of SMB as well, but we also have very, very large enterprise global customers as well. The beauty of this is, you know, it doesn't really matter whether it's, you know, 500 endpoints, 100,000 endpoints, it, it, you know, this platform works exactly the same way. We're a, basically a cloud native software as a service as far as kind of the reporting and the control platform is concerned. So we handle all of the auto scaling in relation to that. You know, people don't need to spend time and money buying SQL servers and trying to configure them and license them. Mm -hmm. It's a simple agent that's installed and it kind of just works. Um, so, you know, if you are a company that wants to understand what normal looks like in relation to user activity data inside a threat and risk and wants to do something about that quickly and wants to regain control, then, you know, yeah. Absolutely. With the company for that, blimey, I'm sounding like a marketing CEO. No, I love it. Yeah, yeah, you've got to get it plugged, Chris. You've got to get it plugged. Um, what's the future then, man? What's the what's the future for this space, particularly ransomware? What, what do you think? Um, and obviously for yourself. I think uh, I think ransomware will continue because um, as much as I say, and as much as many, many CISOs and many security commentators say, let's get the basics right. I think at least through 24, 25, companies will consistently not do that. Yeah. Um, the varying reasons, you know, resource pressure, time pressure, or, you know, being able to tick a box that doesn't necessarily solve security. You know, there are a lot of people that want to do that. Uh, and that's quite sad. Um, I think as things like zero trust and advanced data loss pretend, uh, advanced data loss protection and insider threat technologies expand, I think the window of opportunity for these criminal gangs will narrow slightly. But there will always be targets for these kind of things, unfortunately. Um, for me personally, uh, I'm looking forward to kind of driving kind of this company to uh, greater successes and ensuring that we remain compliant. You know, I'm constantly alongside our dev team, ensuring that we're building our product securely from the inside as well as from the outside. And um, that is uh, that is a thoroughly fun task. So, uh, yeah, Love it. great year ahead. Love it. Well, Chris, all the best of success for the future. Thanks for coming on the show. No, it's been a genuine pleasure to chat to you today, Joseph. It's been great. Thanks, mate. Take care. Thank you for listening. If you've enjoyed today's show, please like and share with your friends and colleagues as this is really important for the show's reach. If you'd like to be our next guest or are interested in Aspron Search's staffing solutions, please get in touch directly with me or reach out to us via our website, www.aspronsearch.com.